Great, how are you? Uh, I'm good, I'm really excited to get to spend a little bit of time with you, uh, mostly because Bay Club, you have to know this amazing Wonder Woman. This is Marissa. She and her partner, Mark, uh, have an amazing business. They're based out of Kansas City. It's called Yoli Tortilleria. They make flour tortillas and corn tortillas in white, in yellow, in blue. Um, she is an amazing, brilliant mind on so many different levels. And I am so, so, so grateful that you're joining us today on Bay Club to teach us something. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I also feel very validated because my bowl looks like your bowl. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how is everything going? What's the, what's the goings-ons in Kansas City? It's going good. Uh, weather's beautiful right now, so we're getting the perfect fall weather right now and we're just going just you're just going you're keeping your head you're keeping your eye on the prize and keeping your head down yeah just hustling away that's the way to do it i think especially in food we always talk about like the man when you're a food entrepreneur it is just like it is a roller coaster every single day and the best way to do it is to just wake up eye on the prize head down plow through yeah. and who knows what each day will bring well, and people have to eat, so, and they like to eat, so. <laughs> and most people really like to eat delicious things, so yes. that's good for you. <laughs> it's good for you, it's good for me, it's good for us at Bake Club, because you are going to teach us how to make something delicious to eat today, right? Yeah, taco stand. What are you teaching us? Taco stand salsa. Yep. So this is the typical, like, in my state of Sonora, which is the north side, um, in uh, Mexico, we make this salsa. Every single taco stand has it. So whether there's a carreta, which is the little, you know, like a motorcycle thing that they have, or like a more established business, this is one of the salsas they will always have available. Taco stand. Okay, do you call it taco stand salsa if you're in the Sonora region of Mexico, or is taco stand salsa what you call it for like bait club because it's something we can wrap our heads around i that's what we started calling it um i think that um i don't even know what we call it because it's just when you go and order tacos you said they ask you uh simple or con todo like just simple or you want everything on it that's you that's your choice you, you didn't get any more choices it's and, all or nothing uh, yeah it's all or nothing yeah are you in or you're not and so, uh, you know, so that's how, I mean, that's what traditionally they do. They do first, you know, like the, the flour tortilla, the carne asada, and then they bring a little bit of moisture with that tomato sauce, so the tomato salsa one. And then, um, and then they put a little squirt of this, which sometimes people call it the fake avocado one because it kind of looks like it's an avocado salsa, but it's not. Got it. Because it's green, like the color of the inside of a beautiful ripe avocado, yep. but it yields something very different in flavor. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. First of all, I love that you're bringing, that you're going to teach us this um, taco stand salsa because I do think it is this beautiful thing, whether you are at a taco stand in Mexico or really anywhere around the U.S. and you are like trying to, ready, excited to get your fix. And you're trying to figure out like, how do you dress it? How do you make the perfect bite? And there is something always really marvelous in a squeeze bottle that you're like, I have, for me at least, I'm speaking in like the rough, I have no clue what it is or I have a sense, but you know that every, my sense is that every single stand does their own thing, makes it a little different, puts their own little signature on it, right? That's what we do as people in food. And, um, it's always like, do I go a little? Do I go a lot? And I've never stopped to sort of go, I, I wonder how you make this gorgeous, magical salsa. And it does feel magical because everyone thinks it's avocado. No one really knows what it is. And everyone sort of does it a little differently. And now you're going to teach us. The yeah. Yeah. That's okay. what... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> There's a lot of variations. Some people will do just jalapenos. Some people will do just serranos. Some people add habaneros. Um, I like kind of like the balance between the jalapenos and the serranos. So that way it's like, it's hot, but it's not like I'm going to die tomorrow. So <laughs> I can sleep through the night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Okay. What are, what are the essentials of taco stand salsa? Because we have serranos, jalapenos, but we also have a few other things, right? Yeah. So I like to go ahead and this is also a, a 
it's up to the taquero, but I like to go ahead and use tomatillos. And one of the things that I wanted to share with everybody is like when you're selecting your tomatillos, if possible, try to get small ones. Mm. The bigger, the bigger they'll be, like they'll be less tart and flavorful. So the smaller ones are the ones that are really packed with flavor. Sometimes you can't, you know, get it all and you'll get these bigger guys. But if you see like really big ones, stay clear of them. They're not going to be as flavorful. So how much does color, we know that size plays a role. So the smaller, the better. How much does the color, like the hue of the green on one of these tomatillos make a difference in the overall flavor? So I feel like the green are going to be really tart, which is great. I, um, I like the really green ones when I'm making a raw salsa. Like if I'm just going to go ahead and do that, um, which is also fantastic. Um, but yeah. And then there's another variation that we never get it here in the States. It's like kind of like this side, but it's a little bit more yellow tone. Um, only like south of um, Mexico City, they, that's where they grow that. Oh, it's fantastic. Very good for cooked green salsas. Oh, interesting. So we're making this taco stand salsa. What I think is brilliant about it are a few different things. One, I know when we were hanging out before, we were talking about like, or I was sort of saying, okay, salsa. Uh, I don't know how many Americans know that salsa translates to just sauce, right? Like it, it could be, it could be, it, salsa could mean so many different things. And I think most Americans think of salsa as like their tomato salsa, right? Like what you can, what you either make fresh in the summertime or what you can buy canned or jarred at your grocery store. Um, but I also love the idea that most, well, I think there's probably a good number of people that think that salsa is this and this only, like a tomato salsa, that salsa only means this, and that salsa can only be raw, i.e. freshly chopped. And I think that is, is, are a few different like inroads to this taco stand salsa. And then beyond that, we're essentially using ingredients that one would not maybe even know uh, or come to think of putting together to make a really delicious, like hot but tangy condiment for a taco. Yeah, it's, it's really good. And also I forgot, there's always garlic on it, so. Yes, so a little garlic, some onion, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then why two different kinds of peppers? Yeah, and so, yeah, and we have the serranos for this one and we have the jalapenos. Why, why two? Why, why, eat, why serrano? Why jalapeno? Why two different types of peppers? I just think it just balances. I think that the serrano for the most part will be the hottest one. Um, it is more peppery when I taste it. Um, and the jalapeno always gives it that freshness, you know, it's just, for me, just, it's like super tasty. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not like super aggressive. You can find some really hot jalapenos, but it's not, you know, to this, it's not going to be a hundred scale. You know, it's always going to be like a, you know, I, I would say the jalapenos on the 50, 40 scale. Got it. Something tells me you have a very high, um, you have a very high tolerance for really delicious, spicy things. <laughs> I, I like people like the jalapeno, you know, it's just, it's not that, you know, it's really for like the earthiness, which I'm like a hundred percent and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I want to make it really hot, I will add one or two habaneros in it. Oh, slam. You'll take it all the way that far. Yeah. So like, you know, my husband, lo Mark loves it like hot. So I will always add habaneros for him. Okay. So the heat scale of peppers, at least in terms of those three is jalapeno, Serrano and then habanero is like fire is coming out of your ears like the yeah. cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> and I in the habanero it gets a bad rap, but I, I think that it's also a really good one because it kind of hits you but it goes away. It just doesn't okay. it doesn't linger that much, but it has a very garlicky taste to me sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know? I think that that's why that's why I feel like habanero always tastes really good with anything garlic based, and also you can do a cook habanero with like carrots and stuff and give it that earthiness. Oh, interesting. It'll take on a few different personalities because of its little garlic, the garlic tone of it gives it a few different inroads. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Right. Where do we start with this taco stand salsa? Yeah. Hold on. I forgot one ingredient. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm definitely going to do that five minutes after you come back. <laughs> all right. So we go ahead and start by cutting all of our tops. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, first. Okay. Got it. And this recipe calls for what? About, I guess it depends on the size to your point, about eight tomatillos. Yeah, about eight tomatillos, eight to 10, usually is what I, and then from a pepper perspective, I always go half and half. Okay. Uh, to, you know, I'll do five serranos, five, uh, um, I don't know, uh, five um, jalapenos. Jalapenos. Yeah. Got it. And, and you want us first to just cut the tops off, i.e. cut like this where the stem hits the pepper. Correct. So you just want it to be like this. Just Got it. Seeds still intact. Seeds all in. I know. People like really freak out when I tell them the seeds are in. And I promise you that it's not going to like make you cry. It'll be fine. I was thinking about you this morning as I was getting all of my ingredients together. I was like washing a container and going to itch my eye. And I was like, all right, I got to break it down for Marissa when we hang out. Like the second you touch any of these peppers, it's basically like if you go in, it's perfect for like COVID times because it is like you want your fingers to be six feet apart from anything close to your face. Otherwise, it is like call the fire department. Yep. Yeah. So pretty much. Like burning. Like there's so many times I don't even wear eye makeup anymore or anything because it's just like it will always we forget. I forget. Yeah, I forget. I also find that like even when you're like scrubbing the heck out of those really amazing peppery oils, it gets stuck and then all of a sudden it's bye. Yeah, and, and then it makes me feel like mother of the year because if my daughter comes in and I'll, and I forget and it was, has been there, you know, and like and then well. <laughs> you're like mom, you're so you're Sienna, you're so beautiful. <laughs> Sorry. Mommy hurt you. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, talk to me. So all we're doing is taking the, the tops off and then it goes straight into a pot. Straight into the pot. Get your quarter of an onion straight in the pot. Garlic, throw it in there. A quarter of an onion is like, um, we're not dicing it. We're not slicing it. We're just taking the skin off. Yep. That's all. I'm very into this. I like a good one bowl or one pot wonder, I got to say. Yeah. And then one clove of garlic, same thing, just skinned off. You could do a little smash. And that's it. That's it. Just to get it up. Ooh, I like, I like this already. <laughs> it's fairly, fairly easy. Okay, so I have five serranos, five jalapenos, all tops off, a quarter of an onion in the pot, clove of garlic. It smells like there's going to be a real party over here. All right, and now you just place your clean tomatillos. You took them out of the husk, so they're clean and ready to go. Yes, and just as is. As is. Wow, this is great. And we want small, the smaller and greener the better, but no need to cut them down in size otherwise. Nope. This is brilliant. And now what we're gonna do is gonna fill water, and you just kinda want it to slightly get ready to cover it. Okay. About it. Um, you don't need that much water. So like just below the lip. Yeah, I'll show you. Okay, let me get eyes. Oh yeah. Okay, got it. So what do you? Think? Oh, that's like maybe an inch. Oh, so things can really stick out. Maybe I put a little too much. So your pot's like maybe half full of water. Yeah, half full. Things can stick out because when it starts boiling, anyways, it's gonna get in. Got it. So it really doesn't matter, and we're not we're not gonna be using any of that water. Got it. All we're trying to do is get them um, poached down, basically. Cool. And this, the contents of this whole pot goes on, what, do you, what would you say, like a high heat or a medium heat? I put mine on medium high. Yeah, medium high. Okay, cool. Oh, I'm so excited about this. Okay, when did you develop this recipe for taco stand salsa? 
You know, it was kind of like I've been making like say tacos for my friends and family and I still like was trying to figure out like what is the magic sauce that they put in our taco stands and we were in uh, Mexico probably a year or two years ago and uh, and I was like tasting it and deciphering it and so I took a little bit with me until I just figure it out until I figure out how to get it to like my favorite taco stands. So it's just, it's been experimentation. I've done like all jalapeno, all serrano, like all the different mixes. And that's how I arrived to this one, so. Okay, would you ever go to like your number one taco stand and say like, hey, what's in, what's in the salsa? Like, is that a faux pas or is that for you just like a sense of pride where you're like, I'm gonna figure this out? For me, it's almost like I wanna figure it out. Like, got it. I gotta taste it and I gotta figure out like, can I, like, can, is my palate sophisticated enough that I can figure it out? I don't know. <laughs> but I think like that very much resonates with me because when I think about like when I am making something, I am chasing down similarly this nostalgic flavor, right? This thing that I know and I love and I think is like the best food memory from childhood, from being a teenager, from being my 20s, whatever. Uh -huh. And there's almost something about you don't want to know how it's made because it's deeper than a recipe. Like it's, it is much deeper. And there's something about knowing that it's like the emotion of how you put the flavors together and how it resonates that makes the recipe become what it is. And I like that for me very much resonates when I think of you because so much of Yoli is based off of nostalgia and memory and tradition right i mean who is this babe that's my mom yeah yeah so it was taken from a picture that she's leaning in a car and she has a bandana and she always had those big round sunglasses i mean she had them even after they were no longer cool <laughs> she always had those big round sunglasses so yeah so it was I mean, we really started doing Yoli because, you know, I missed home. And so I'm trying to remember everything. And, you know, food is just that vehicle to just bring those memories back. So you um, are from Mexico, from the Sonora region of Mexico. Mm -hmm. You uh, moved to the States. You live many lives. Bay Club, I just want to say this incredible Wonder Woman uh, could also just go to Italy with you and be your translator as well. <laughs> she studied abroad in Florence. That's where she met Mark. But talk, talk to me like on the deeper level of like you were missing home, but like being homesick and starting an entire business around it are two very different things. Most people like sit in their sweatpants and look through a photo album and say, I'm homesick. Uh, very few people say I'm going to start one of the greatest tortilla companies in the United States because I miss home. <laughs> and just, you know, it's like one thing half one after the other. It just, we didn't really plan it to be like that. Uh, certainly it was really, we were experimenting. We were really trying to do something that really, you know, made us remember what it tasted like mm -hmm. and uh, have those conversations over beers and tequila and such. And, um, you know, and we just kept on going and we're like, oh, this is going to be the side gig. You know, this is, we're going to do this weeknights and maybe weekends and then bam, you know, you start getting accounts after accounts and you just jump in. It's like, okay, well, I guess we are doing this, you know? Oh but so, okay. So you, you, um, you sadly lost both of your parents when you were in your twenties. Yeah, it was, um, my mom when I was 20 and my dad with 21. So my mom had battled MS for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then my dad had a car accident a year after them. Oh. So it was uh, kind of like one of those weird moments, you know, that it was like, okay. But it, it was, my mom said was so recent that I don't think we had a lot of time to process it. It was like, it was going through the motions of like, oh, I know how to run a funeral. I'm 20 years old and I know what to do. So yeah, it's, you know, but life happens and we move on. So when did you leave home as a kid? Like, when did you go out on your own to go to school, to like go and chase after your own life and your own like sense of self? So I had moved uh, first uh, to Puebla when I was, uh, when I was 17. And, um, and I studied there at the university over there and everything. And then that's when my mom was getting sicker. So I came back 
and I actually uh, took care of her until she passed. And then I decided, okay, well, you know, do I stay in Mexico or do I do something different? And my mom's family, they all graduated from University of Arizona. And so that's when I decided, you know, Arizona just kind of feels like my mom's side, you know? So I just ended up going out there. And uh, it was like fantastic for me because I'm a desert rat. So that was perfect for me. <laughs> so yeah, it was very fun. I, you know, I did the typical college thing. You wait tables and work and study and it was fun. And at some point you sort of said when you were done with college, like you had this um, like yearning for home. Yeah, and you know, it really, for me, the union at home started after I got recruited to move to Kansas City. And so it kind of, the Midwest, and especially in Kansas City, there is some Mexican presence, but it wasn't like in Arizona. Mm. And so there, I was really like looking for my Sonoran style food, and which was non-existent. And mm. you have a lot of good Mexico City stuff, you have maybe some other stuff, but not Sonoran. And that's where my search really started. Interesting. Okay, will you break down for Bake Club, like what is Sonoran style food versus what someone might understand as Mexico City food? Because they're two very distinct regions outright, but especially when it comes to cuisine and ingredients. Yeah, so I have here, let me show you, I'm bringing it over. So in Sonora, we're by the Gulf of California, but we're also huge cattle ranchers. So we eat a lot of seafood, morning, lunch, typically. Steak is reserved for dinner time. And um, we only salt and pepper the steak because we want to make sure that it's good, you know, we're letting it shine. Um, most of the steak in Sonora is all grass-fed, mm. so very few uh, grain. You know, people argue about that. Like, you will be sitting somewhere, and people are arguing, like, I didn't like this steak because it's grain. And it's, how do you know that I can taste it? Like, because how is grain-fed versus grass-fed? Oh, oh, they argue about that all the time. So it's, it's really funny, you know, it's just, we're big cow ranchers. Uh, the other thing, so we only put uh, salt and pepper. We mix our cuts. So depending on the quality of your taquero, you're going to get better cuts. And we typically use, you know, like a ribeye. Um, we use skirt as well. Um, this is hanger. Uh, some people, if you want to get fancy, you're going to get some aged steak in there. Maybe even, like there's one taquero. Uh, in my hometown, like he's famous to even put filet on his tacos, but it's like it's a mix. You know? Filet mignon on your tacos, on your tacos. Your and so you all of a sudden you'll be sitting there and you're like, oh my god, this is butter in my mouth, and you're like, oh yeah, well I have filet right now. In it. So I mean, it's like really what they do is they salt and pepper and whatever they get, you know, they all have some high cuts and some low end cuts. And that's how, and then they when they grill it usually over mesquite wood, mm. and uh, and then they go ahead and chop it and they chop all the cuts together, and that's where the magic happens. You know, it's just they're all mingling together, talking to each other. Some you get some more fatty pieces talking to the lean ones, and it's it's heaven. So that's brilliant. So how small do uh, does like a typical taquer in Sonora cut up? Um, their meat, acknowledging they're all different cuts. Is it kind of like little quarter inch? Yeah, it's thick? like this. Um, you know, it's still, I always call it very chewable. It's still, you know, um, but it's, it's not super fine. So the one thing that I always say is like, when you see the taquero that it has tiny, tiny pieces of meat, run away because it's like, <laughs> I see. Not as good meat. <laughs> Hiding something. If it's too small, way too small, yeah. that go, go in the other direction because the taquero that's using the filet, he is going to be like bite size, but they want you to know that the good Oh, they want you to know, exactly. <laughs> so when you get the tiny, tiny piece, it's like, uh, what am I eating? Am I eating really steak? You know, like, mm -hmm. that's just like the joke that we do. And, and there are some taqueros that do like really tiny pieces. I don't go to them. Mm. Okay. So, and then again, the steak is a fried, you know, fried and joey. So. 
Got it. And then always flour tortillas? Always, unless you're like, some people, if you're on a diet, you, you ask for corn. You say like, oh, if, you know, if there's a girl that comes in and asks for corn, it's like, oh, she's on a diet. <laughs> I like I like the girl on the diet is like still crushing a whole lot of like misty grilled red meat. Yeah, so traditionally, you know, if the tortillas were it's flour. Usually they're about this size when you're going to the tacos. Um, they they were traditionally made with pork fat, but most of the flour tortillas now are made with um, actually manteca. Uh, what's that? I guess it's shortening. Yes. And they do it because they're doing the tortillas and their little corner tortilla areas. It's really hot and mm. they want to deal with the lard going bad. Got it. That's the reason Got I do it. it. But we do one with um, avocado oil, which kind of makes that shortening. And they're super thin, as you can see. They're not like paper thin, but they're thin. But no, they the are. I'm, I'm trying. Oh, there it is. There's a good one. I mean, so Marissa, break it down for us, okay? When I see a tortilla like this, I'm like, everyone get away from my plate because I'm not sharing anything. And I will, I'm like, I'll share most things. But the beauty of like, there's a translucence to your tortillas that are so dramatically different than like, I don't want to say the store-bought tortilla because you can get Yoli tortillas at the store. You can order them online and so on. But why do people make flour tortillas so differently than the right way to make them? You know, I don't know. It's a weird question. I just do not know why they do that. Uh, you know, I think that it's just multi-generations and also, you know, depending on which tribe was probably using it. There are areas in my, uh, in the state of Sonora that they make ones that call sobaqueras, which they're huge. Yes. Uh, and those are only made with flour, water, and salt, nothing else. And mm -hmm. somehow with their technique, they're able to get it really, really thin. Now, you know, if you got to go, and that's the Yaki's tribe, but if you go with the Yaki tribes closer to Arizona, they make them thicker, like more like, right? More like a, so I, I think that, I think that commercially people just landed on something in the middle. Um, the biggest I mean, it's, it's almost like a croissant, but I can see the layers. I already cut myself off some of the snack. I can already see the layers of your tortilla in like the most beautiful way. Like for me, when I am out to eat or looking for a great tortilla, this translucence for me, like the translucence equals fat on some level, like quality fat. And then it also equals um, thinness. And that thinness is gonna deliver you what? I guess just the right balance of tortilla to carne to salsa and so on. Correct, that and also the flour type is incredibly important. So sonora flour is really low in protein. protein. Interesting. So, uh, and also for me, it's like the right combination with uh, if it has barley or not and plug but the percentage of barley, and we can totally geek out on, on you know, flowers. I think that we had over 30 flowers in my pantry when we were testing and testing and testing. And um, we even brought flour from Sonora, you know, kind of like this, this meet the test, you know, and stuff like that. And finally, we arrived to the ones that we thought were the most flavorful ones because mm -hmm. I feel like a good tortilla, it should taste good on its own. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like that's, and then the other thing oh. is here. So once you heat it up, it should have like a little bit of elasticity to it. Mm. And then mm. it have that little beautiful like tear in it. And totally. if it's really easy, that means that, you know, you have a wrong flour protein level. I mean, it's so flavorful. I totally, being with one of your tortillas and eating it and hearing the story of, I was missing home and I was, um, I guess like, like hungering for home, for, um, comfort, for, um, something familiar. Mm -hmm. And this idea that you went looking for something that would give you the flavor of home and you couldn't find it. And that sort of nuance of like, when you, when you when your heart is calling out for something in life and you go looking for it, 
and you can't find it, i.e. nobody else has come close enough to delivering it, that's when you build it yourself, right? Like something doesn't exist in the world that you know has that much power and that much emotion behind it. You blaze your own trail and you go and build it yourself. And I love that that is the story, the beginning story of Yoli, but you now have been around for for a few years and you are crushing it through so many different lenses. You have corn tortillas now as well, right? You have you have white, you have red, you have yellow, you have blue. You have a shop in Kansas City. Like give us the lowdown of what we know where Gilly came from now. What has it evolved into? Oh gosh, it has really evolved into, you know, I used to post a lot of pictures of like what we were eating and I posted the recipes. I did like one year challenge uh, to go ahead and kind of sh share people like, Hey, this, I would did, do a different taco recipe every week. And I would just post it out there. And it's like, and everybody was like, I love the recipes, but can you just make them for me? That would be like usually the question, but I was just wanting to go ahead and share all the different things that you could do. And um, in our shop, I really wanted the, again, the nostalgia feeling of what you get probably in a bakery as well, that you just walk in, get your daily bread, you eat here you get your daily tortillas. And then I wanted to curate it with other items that you can go ahead and take home and enjoy it with. And so that's kind of what we have been doing. And so that's when we started making all these different salsas and we're really keeping them seasonal and people are just really enjoying them. And then now it's tamal season. so. We're doing tons of tamales. Uh, so we bring in, we do them from the fall all the way until spring and then we shut it down. And so we just, it's for me, like it should be cold when you're coming out tamale. That's like my personal preference. And it should be like a family gathering event. And oh. so, yeah, so we're doing tamales, we're doing salsas. We're doing beverages, so one of the things, or chapas when you find them most places, it's like, you know, it's kind of like the, the mix that they use, you know? Instead mm -hmm. of doing it, I mean, we're getting our rice, we're doing the whole thing from scratch. Uh, we're doing cafe de la olla. We're doing all kinds of different things. And again, people just now come in and sometimes we'll get, you know, like they're getting their tortillas and they get their coffee and it's just fun, it's just fun. That does that, does it feel like a, a piece of Sonora is finally in Kansas City with you? It feels like that very much so, specifically because of the building that we're, we're able to get. It's a corner and my favorite tortillas from my hometown have always landed in corners and I thought that that was like a signal. <laughs> and it's totally. like, it's really tiny. You know, it can be big for me. You know, it had to be like a tiny little spot that you're just going in, in the neighborhood, you're walking in, and it just, it just felt perfect for us. So, yeah. I love, well, one of my favorite stories that you've told me too is, so you can, you can buy a lot of um, Marissa's uh, delicious products online, Bay Club, so you better show up if you're not in Kansas City. But, um, or around Kansas City. But my favorite is that like the person from Brooklyn sent their sibling to seek you out in Kansas City, right? It's wild. It is so wild. We'll get people like, oh yeah, I'm from, you know, I'm from here from Kansas City and my brother lives in there and he told me that he got your tortillas and they love them and I, and how dare I, I'm in Kansas City and not even know you. <laughs> so it's like, okay. So it's just kind of funny. Yeah, amazing. We get visitors from all over. We get uh, people from, you know, farther out from Kansas City and they will say that we are their one stop. Mm. Like, and we're off the highway too, which actually may, makes it really easy for people to pop in and out. So. I love that. And will you tell Bait Club what kind of stuff they can ship online if they aren't in an epic road trip distance from Kansas City? Yeah, so we have all of our tortillas online, so. Got it. So the flour, the, or sorry, the flour in avocado and in pork fat, which is, yeah, I'm going to make a quilt out of the pork fat ones and sleep under it tonight. And all of the corn tortillas. All the corn tortillas. With mom on them. Yeah. Yeah. And if you see on the blue one, 
So the story, I don't know if I told you, but, but the story is that we, my parents were kind of crazy and they used to put us in this epic road trips. And that's the car, the Datsun. We used to have a Nissan Datsun. And they used to like cram us in this car, no air conditioning, mind you. And the whole summer from Sonora, which we're up in the north, all the way to Yucatan. And that's what it's representing like. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, what a brilliant logo. And so that's what it is. It's the car, it's all the road trips. And I'm just so lucky because, you know, I just had parents that were so into like Mexico and the cuisine and everything. And um, they really taught us appreciation of all the indigenous people and making sure that we understood where things come. And, you know, I, my dad was a lawyer, so it was always some historical colonization thing that <laughs> we had to learn. And so, yeah, so I was very lucky. We did this for many years until I was probably 12 or 13 when we were like just too big and we're like going like this, you know? Yes, and you're like, we need a car with air conditioning. That sweet Datsun was probably on its last leg. Oh my God, it was awful. It was awful. And then the roads in Mexico, I mean, I'm old. So it's like back then, like some of them were nice and some of them were like dirt. It was like two way things and there's no rest stops, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so that's kind of like, it's a lot of nostalgia just exploring and learning new things. And I feel like in general, I think that um, there's so much more exploration to be done with Mexican cuisine. There's so oh. much diversity in it. So I think it's fun. So. Uh, I love that. You're our shepherd through it too. I love the way you put it, the like, <clears throat> there's so much curiosity and exploration to happen through like the lens of nostalgia. One, when you're like in it and you don't realize that this is like defining how you're gonna feel when you're 20 or 30 or whatever, right? When you're 12 or 10, you have like maybe a totally different appreciation. But even now looking back, this idea of like remembering your taco stand and remembering the salsa and remembering the texture and the tear and the translucence and the layers of your flour tortilla, how much shapes us long, long, long ago and how much we, like, where do we store it? You know what I mean? Cause we kind of don't reference it for a good 10 plus years, right? Where does it go? Is it like in our fingertips or our toes or our knees? And then what is it that makes us want to pull it out and bring it to life? I know it's, it's unbelievable. We had one guy that came in and I mean, his eyes got teary eyed and just thinking about her grandma's tortillas. And it just feels really weird, you know, like, like but it's like, he was like, hey, this has just brought me to like my, you know, grandma's house and they're all cooking tortillas by hand. And I haven't had anything like this since then. And, you know, I didn't get the recipes. Nobody got the recipes. Nobody got to learn them. So it's like lost. And so, but it's kind of like that, you know, like that trigger, you know, that you eat something and all of a sudden you're back to whatever, I call it the ratatouille moment, right? So in the ratatouille, when he's there and he's taken back, that's how I like to feel about food. Oh, oh, that's what good food does, right? Yeah, or create new ones, right? The oh, first that's true, that's true. It locks a moment in brand new. Yeah. Really yeah. true. Okay, my taco stand salsa is boiling. I can smell it. You get like um, that, the heat of the peppers in the air just of the kitchen as it boils down. How long do we let our pot go? So it's actually probably ready. So it's probably ready because your tomatillos should have turned now like this, I call it khaki green. Yes. So it's ready to be put in the blender. Once oh your you get to that khaki green, you know that you're ready to go. Okay, got it. So we're looking for khaki green. Okay, hold on, I'm coming. <laughs> this is when you're like, you think you have all your mise en place and then you're like, right, we're making salsa. Of course I don't have my blender. <laughs> okay. And you, um, you, you strain the water off of the pot, right? Strain it off because you have the tomatillos and they'll have moisture in it. So you don't need any more. Got it.
why, why do we boil this down, Marissa, as opposed to whatever, chopping raw and so on? What's the nuance behind it? You know, I think it's also uh, one of the things is the texture piece. Mm -hmm. uh, they are like uh, similar to this that you will go ahead and um, start by boiling. Then you do a rough, um, you know, uh, blender on it and then bring it back into it and then cook it down. But you want texture on this. This is the opposite. You want this as smooth as possible. Like, Oh, interesting. Got it. And so this like tenderizes all of the skins of the peppers and the tomatillos. Um, does it mute the flavor at all boiling it or does it just make it to a consistency that we can puree? Is it more about texture than it is about flavor? I think that it does. Uh, the pepper themselves do get a little bit mutated on, uh, you know, they got a little bit less hot on them. Mm -hmm. but I think a lot of it has to do with the texture piece. Got it. So um, okay. We're adding So I do one tablespoon. You can do white vinegar, apple cider, white wine vinegar. Got it. And does this just bring out like the acid in those tomatillos that you were talking to us about? Bring that acid and also uh, um, helps you um, last a little bit longer. Oh, interesting. Shelf life. <laughs> yeah. I love that. So now we're going to blend it. Let's go up here. So I give it a couple goes on its own. It's beautiful. And then the magic is gonna happen here. We're gonna add half a cup of, I have avocado oil, you can use grapeseed oil. Um, some takeras will use vegetable canola oil. I like avocado. And what does this oil do? Is it for viscosity? Yes, for that, it just gives it like that emulsified guacamole like you know oh interesting okay got it so because tomatillos onions peppers they're all water-based so adding a little bit of oil to it really brings it together and sort of thickens it yeah and then uh, at this point you can you can wait until the end i add like probably like half a teaspoon of salt and got then we can add more but i use some salt can i also just say like the brilliance of one, if you have like a sneeze that's about to come out and you need it to like come out, if you stick your nose in the pitcher, like it's so fresh and so vibrant, but it tickles your nose in the most beautiful, like it feels like it's just dancing on your little nose hairs in a very playful way, which is pretty like, I feel like I'm alive with you smelling this taco stand salsa. Oh, it smells so good, doesn't And pretty much you just want all your speckles to be gone. So okay, so we're, so we're pureeing for like another 60 seconds plus. You want your speckles to be gone and do like, do seeds get pureed in? Everything gets pureed, so oh, wow. it gets like no speckles whatsoever. Oh, mine's in a great place. Okay, got it. So that's like another 60, 90 seconds or so. Yeah. Ooh. 
Oh my gosh, this looks um, incredible. Wow, okay. So it makes about four cups of this insane, brilliant salsa. Yeah, I like to eat it with chips as well or whatever. Ooh, that's good. I'm gonna have, this is like the gift that's gonna keep, I'm just, I'm just gonna eat um, chopped up cuts of meat and your tortillas in all different ways, shapes, and form all week long. <laughs> we have like, a girl that works with us and she, for lunch break, she just grabs a fresh tortilla and just dips it on this and that's her lunch usually. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so uh, I have a question. When do you know to use flour and when do you know to use corn aside from the hilarious you eat corn when you're watching what you eat. <laughs> yeah, so if you're having meat steak like this, you will always go flour, uh, any barbecue, any fatty thing like that, you will go uh, flour. Everything else will be corn like for the Got most part. So uh, like either things like chicken, seafood, vegetable always goes on corn. Always typically goes in corn. There's a couple you know, if you're having maybe a really fatty fish, you could go ahead and use uh, uh, flour tortilla, but for the most part, we use corn on everything. Okay. And Sorry. there is one Sonoran taco that I have in, uh, in my Instagram and highlights. Uh, it's called Lorenza, and it's, uh, it's probably the only official corn taco that we have in Sonora. And it's like we make it almost into a tostada, and then we uh, slather it with a little bit of beans. And then we go ahead and put steak and then the cheese and we just let it melt, you know, in the grill. <coughs> and, then we, and then we add all the traditional uh, fixings and that's called Lorenza. No, no idea where the name came from. I'm assuming it's a woman called Lorenza at some point. But yeah, and Lorenza also is like nicknamed to like crazy. So like a lot of people call it oh, Lorenza and that means that you're kind of crazy. Maybe someone was like, girl, you crazy for making this corn tortilla to a tostada and putting all the things you're supposed to put on a flour tortilla. But yeah. you know, that's the stuff I love the best. It's like breaking the rules a little bit. Oh yeah, I love it too. I love it. I think that, but with that, you know, even though that that's the, the norm in general, I think that anything can go and I think that everybody should be as creative as they want to be. Got it. So they're really, they're really, there are guidelines, but there are no rules. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, so talk to me. How would you make, like, what is the Marissa tortilla build? I have some beautiful steak that I also cooked, but now I feel like I should have got six different cuts based on, based on, like, oh, I gotta, chop, I gotta chop my meat. Hold on. <laughs> now I know better. Oh my gosh. This is brilliant. And when do you eat tacos? Like when are your favorite moments to eat tacos? Is it any meal of the day? Are there specific moments in life that inspire the taco, like the tacos, the style of putting um, a plate together like tacos or what? Oh, for me, it's every meal of the day. So it really doesn't matter. It could be a snack. It could be a Breakfast, breakfast, that's the other one probably. I really like breakfast tacos with flour tortillas versus corn. Ooh. Ooh. I think that's- And do you do the same thing with your breakfast um, tacos, always meat? Always um, meat? No, it would just be uh, chorizo. I, yeah, I guess meat. It would be chorizo and egg. Um, we also do a one that's called machaca, which is basically dehydrated beef. Uh, and then they grind it like almost like it's like, hairs like really 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 fine and uh and then you rehydrate it when you're ready to go ahead and cook it um with um uh, with ch chopped tomatoes you you saute the tomatoes onions chilies and then you bring in the machaca in and rehydrate it all with that and then you do a breakfast taco with that or a burrito that sounds incredible yeah okay all right, so I, I'm also slicing some radishes and some cucumbers. Yeah. Because Marissa, my taco guide, um, told me that those were good places to start. Yeah, so in every single taco stand, you will always have radishes and cucumbers, and they will just go ahead and, like, literally, they just put a platter of them in front of you while you're 
waiting for your tacos and you just snack and munch on them all day long. So that's kind of the thing. And then I forgot. And we always have grilled onions if you, if you have them. Ooh, amazing. So, all right, so let's go ahead and start. So you heat up your tortilla. Uh, again, this one's because they're Sonoran style, they're high fat, you can do it super, super fast. You don't have to, you know, wait a hundred years for them because otherwise they'll become tostada. But then, you know, so that's, you heat up your tortilla. You go ahead and add your steak to it. So steak goes down. Once the tortilla is warm, steak goes down. Steak goes down first. Then we do, the next thing we do always is the cabbage. Got it. And what's your like, how do you give yourself guardrails? Like, do you give yourself an inch from each side so you don't get spillage? Or do you go edge to edge? You know, I go ahead and get myself pretty much in the middle side. So, so I can, you know, spillage. In some of the taquerias, the supposedly the, the test is that it doesn't close quite all the way. Got it. Got it. That's like a sign of generosity. Like that's when you know you're with a good taquero. Yeah, and it's kind of like the, the steak is kind of spilling from your hand while you're eating it. But I mean, come on. <laughs> It's meant to be messy, it's hand, right? Like it's finger food. Yeah, and then always we do like a little splash of this tomato sauce. And so I wrote down the recipe for Bake Club too. So all you do is poach your tomatoes, peel them, and then blend them with chiltepin. Chiltepin, if you can get it, you can get it online. In Sonora, this one grows wild. So there's wild bushes and they're hand-picked, you know, it's very, it's not an easy thing to grow, uh, but there are some growers in California and Arizona, so you can actually get it. Um, so you put some chiltepin in this and some oregano, if you can get it. Ooh. And it's really good. So. Okay, so I have my meat in the middle, um, very generously, some cabbage, some of that tomato salsa bay club. Marissa's got the recipe for you. It's online, don't you worry. And if you can get the chultipi an extra credit. <laughs> yep. And then what, some of our taco stand salsa? Some of the taco stand salsa. And that's mm -hmm. it. Amazing. Yeah. And then what condiments do you normally find? Like, is the idea of like fresh radish and fresh cucumber just like texture and spirit, if you want it? Yeah, it's usually like a snack stuff that you have on the side. Got it. Also, it kind of cools you down, cools your mouth down. Ooh, got it. From the heat of those amazing peppers and tomatillos? Yeah. Okay, are you ready to see mine? Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Ooh. Oh, wait, did we put cheese? No cheese. No cheese, no. This is just fresh and delicious. Oh, some lime. Okay, got it. I'm, I'm on lime next. Marissa, this looks incredible. Okay, Bay Club, um, we got to sign off because it's about to get messy finger food and there will be no manners left. I also haven't washed my fingers yet, so there's no eye touching after this. Otherwise, I'm just going to cry and make Marissa really uncomfortable with how brilliant she is and how grateful we are for her showing up to teach us the ins and the outs of the taco stand salsa, the power of nostalgia, the immediacy of building the thing that doesn't exist when your heart calls out for it. Marissa, we are so, so, so happy to have you on Bay Club. Uh, and Bay Club, you better show up for Yoli Tortilla, the recipe for the taco stand salsa, and how to craft and build this gorgeous taco. It's online too, all for you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Mama.